and it's definitely an issue, but it's not a new issue. So I think uh, that has a lot to do with that red tide. Now, this red tide has made everybody aware of these environmental issues, and now everybody's up in arms, got their pitchforks out when this issue has been in the Gulf for a long time. So it's growing, and I don't think it has anything to do with temperature. I think uh, at the Gulf Council, actually, uh, Leanne Brosarge, who's a representative from Mississippi, uh, and she's very, very interested in the hypoxic zone. It's been kind of one of her pet babies over the last two years. I've heard her talk about it at multiple meetings. And she and all the research that I've seen, they actually did a presentation not too long ago at one of the council meetings that I sat in on and it had a lot to do, what they're blaming it on, is it had a lot to do with the Mississippi River and all the agriculture along the Mississippi River, all those farms and uh, same thing that we're blaming. In Okeechobee. Yeah, same thing we're blaming in Okeechobee, except for it's happening in the Gulf of Mexico because the Mississippi River is a whole lot bigger than the Okeechobee. Mm -hmm. So you have all those farms all the way from Illinois all the way down the Mississippi River and all that nitri or nutrients and nitrates and phosphorus and all that is getting dumped into that river and pouring into the Gulf and that's what they believe is causing that hypoxic zone. So all that to say, I think we're in the state of our society and our culture where uh, a lot of sensationalization is happening when it comes to anything environmental because we're all up in arms, we're all stewards of our environment. We all want our healthy environment. So I don't think the temperature has so much to do with that as much as it is just everybody's heightened alertness uh, when it comes to environmental issues. But uh, I went around and around, but I think I answered your question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Let's talk a little bit about snapper fishing because that's what I like doing. Uh, so I brought some of my rods and reels over here, some of my toys uh, that I'd like to discuss here real quick. Uh, one thing uh, that I pride uh, myself on is making sure that you hold bottom and you can feel the bottom. Now I say that and a lot of people look at me and roll their eyes like, I know how to do that. I've been fishing offshore before. But what I notice when I'm out there fishing on a party boat, what really sets people apart is you'll have the guy on the boat who catches uh, their limit a mangrove snapper like that. And then you have the guys on the boat that really struggle to catch the mangroves. And a mangrove snapper can set an advanced angler apart from an inexperienced or a moderately experienced angler very quickly because they're a very smart, very quick biting, very aggressive fish, but they can be tricky to catch. To catch mangrove snappers uh, consistently and catch them often, you really have to be good at what you're doing. And there's a couple tricks to it. Presenting your bait naturally, holding bottom naturally, and making sure you can feel the bait. And when you get the hang of feeling that bait, that makes you better at all the other sorts of fishing, bottom fishing in my opinion. So when I was a kid growing up on the boat, I really liked catch a mangrove snapper. Because in my opinion, I've always thought that they're a hard fish to catch and when you can master that offshore in deep water, because they just come up and peck at that bait. It's not like they slam it like a grouper and you, you have to be quick, you have to be uh, agile, and you have to be able to feel it. So there's a few tricks. Uh, the, my biggest trick, if you don't know, uh, if you haven't heard me talking about it everywhere, is a double snell rig. Everybody familiar with the double snell rig? Anybody not familiar? All right. So what a double snell rig does is it essentially gives you two hooks and one piece of bait. The two hooks are not for two pieces of bait. You take one uh, sardine or one thread fin, you cut the head, you cut the tail, and you put a what's called a plug on there. So now you have nothing but meat on two hooks. So that way, anywhere that snapper bites that piece of bait, he's gonna get one of my hooks in his mouth. So it gives your hookup ratio uh, is increased exponentially because you have more of a chance of hooking that fish. So double snell hooks work really well for snapper fishing. Does everybody use those for snapper fishing? All right. Um, also, making sure that you have the right tool for the job as far as your rod and reel is concerned. Uh, a lot of times I'll see out there that the rod is a big issue. I like having, hold on to that lead for me, bud. <clears throat> Grab that lead pretty tight. You're a big guy, you can hold on, right? Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of times what I'll see is they'll have the wrong type of rod. 
What I really like, and in my opinion, what works best is a very soft tip. I'm just barely pulling up on that rod and my tip's bending. But if I pull up really hard, you can see here that my backbone is not bending. The backbone of the rod is still pretty solid. Thanks, man. So you've got a sensitive tip and you've got a strong backbone. That way I can feel any sort of action going on. And then if I hook that fish, I've got a strong enough backbone to fight the fish. Then also the right kind of line. When you're fishing in deep water, definitely having braid gives you more sensitivity. But there is certain instances where braid isn't a good option. Uh, and for example, braid, if you use straight braid, your fish can shake your hook. Have you ever been fishing offshore with straight braid and you're reeling up a fish and all of a sudden it comes unhooked? You know what I'm talking about? Well, it happens a lot. If you're fishing braid right to your swivel and you catch a fish and you're reeling it up, a lot of times you'll just lose the fish. And what's happening is that fish can, uh, when he's shaking his head, especially snappers, they tear a hole in the side of their face. When you reel that fish up, that hook is just barely hanging in that hole. You know what I'm talking about? Have you seen that before? That is from the not enough stretch in your line or not enough stretch in your rod and reef or in your rod. You want to be able to give that fish some stretch so that way when he's shaking his head, he's not able to tear that hole because that hole allows him to spit your hook more easily. So how you combat that is by using monofilament top shot on top of your braid, making sure you have a rod that has a flexible tip or at least a, a little bit of flex to it. And then also you want to make sure that you keep consistent pressure. What's uh, mangroves, what, how I know mangrove snapper are super smart is I can tell you when I get a mangrove snapper hook because they fight the same way. They fight super hard when they're close to the bottom. And once you get them up off the bottom and they lose sight of the bottom, they all of a sudden stop fighting, right? They're not stopping fighting. What they're doing is they're swimming up to the boat as quick as they could, can, with their mouth open, shaking their head. And that's how you lose fish because if you slow down, if you slow down your cranking, he's going to be able to go past your lead and get slack. And as soon as he has slack, if there's any little chance, any little weak point in the side of his face, he's going to be able to spit your hook. So a lot of times I'll see a customer or a guest or a client or a friend and they hook that snapper, they're reeling up, they're reeling up and all of a sudden he stops fighting because he's swimming up with you and they're like, oh, is he still there? Nope. You just spit your hook because you stopped reeling. So you really got to keep consistent, steady pressure. Also, when it comes to big fish, big snapper, and even grouper, a lot of times that first 10, 15, 20 feet is the hardest part of the battle. You're battling that fish to get him up off the bottom, off the ledge, off the rock pile, off the wreck, so he doesn't break you off. Once you have him up off the bottom, slow it down. I can see when you're fighting that first part, pumping that rod, lifting that rod tips, reeling down, working hard to get that fish up off the bottom and really struggling and fighting to win the battle. But once you have that fish up the, off the bottom, he's not gonna break you off in anything. At that point, the only person that can break that fish off is you. You gotta slow it down, finesse that fish and let him run if he wants to run. I even sometimes will back off the drag if I think that fish may have uh, touched the wreck or touched the lead or got me into his hole. Once I get him up off the bottom, sometimes I'll even back down the drag a little bit. That way that fish has some give and I treat it like one of those video games. You know those fishing video games where you got the meter and that meter's pegging when that fish is, the rod tip's bending? I treat it like that and have some fun with it. Once he's off the bottom, all you have to do is keep consistent pressure and not let that meter go into the red. So if your rod tip starts bending, point your rod tip at him, let him run. Stop reeling. A lot of times I see people lose really quality, fit, quality fish because once they win the battle, then all of a sudden they're still jerking on that rod, pumping that fish, reeling as hard as they can. Slow it down, you won. You can still screw it up if you want, but <laughs> slow it down, finesse that fish. Once you get them off the bottom, it's all about finesse. Also making sure you have the right reel. For snapper fishing especially, high gear ratio is better. The higher the gear ratio, the more speed you have. But the higher the gear ratio, you still have a lot of speed, but you have a very little power. So that's why these new two speed fancy reels are so nice. Because not only do you have that high gear ratio, high speed, but with the click of a button, it's all of a sudden 
like I'm fishing with this reel and I'm fishing with this reel. Because with the click of a button, I go from using this reel to using this reel. It's really, really cool for that reason. That's why I like fishing with these two speed reels. And nowadays with the technology the way it is, these two speed reels have become much more affordable and you can get a two speed reel for as cheap as like 250 bucks, which I guess is still pretty expensive. But in relation to what they were when they first came out four or five years ago, that's really cheap. So two speed reels are great for that reason. Let me demonstrate for you real quick. So you see where the lead's at, where, where the lead is positioned. Just focus on that lead. I'm gonna make one revolution of this handle. You're gonna see how far that lead travels. So one revolution of that handle. That lead traveled a pretty long distance. That's because I'm in high gear ratio, high speed. One revolution in that handle retrieved a lot of line. So when you're out there fishing in deep water and that snapper bites, and I turn that handle one time, I'm retrieving a lot of that line. It makes it easier for me to set the hook. Now, in low gear ratio, with a simple press of a button, now I'm in low gear. I just downshifted my truck to get up the hill. So now I'm in low gear. Low gear gives me more power, but less speed. So with low gear, I'm gonna reel it up a little bit so you can see better. With low gear, watch how far that lead travels with one revolution of the handle. Didn't travel very far, did it? Only about a foot, maybe a little bit more. So low gear ratio definitely has more power for that reason. Uh, so that's the benefit of the two speed reel is you're able to have that high gear ratio to set the hook and then if you get a big fish, you hit a button, you address that lever drag a little bit, and all of a sudden it's like a whole different reel is in your hand. So two-speed reel works really well for mangrove snapper fishing, especially this time of year, because gag groupers open. In the springtime, and before gags are open, when you're mangrove snapper fishing and you hook a big fish, yeah, so what, he broke me off. I didn't want to catch the gag anyway to take a photo of and have to release it, you know? Uh, whereas when gags are open, you hook that gag, you want to have a chance to land them. And that's the way you do it with the two speed reel and you use a little heavier leader. For example, when gags aren't open, I'm fishing for mangroves with 40, 50 pound test. When gags are open, I'm fishing for mangroves with 60, 80 pound test because I want a chance to land that gag grouper. And you won't be able to if you're still fishing with that 40 pound test. But also holding the bottom. So what I mean by holding the bottom, which a lot of people, even really surprisingly experienced people, don't really uh, accomplish very well, I notice. So holding the bottom, what that means is when the boat's moving up and down, you gotta move your rod tip with the boat. So sir, you're gonna be my rock and bottom. <laughs> so put your hand out flat and move your hand up and down like the boat's moving. And you'll notice my rod tip's going right with the boat. And I don't even have to look at his hand. I can just do it by feel. And I know I'm keeping my line tight enough to, to uh, feel the lead, but not tight enough to disturb that lead in his hand. His hand is totally flat, right? Your hand's totally flat, yeah. right? So if I disturb that lead, the lead's gonna fall out of his hand. And I can do it without looking because I'm just getting a feel for it and making sure my lead's not moving. Because every, all right, I'm good. <laughs> so the reason behind that is when you disturb that lead on the bottom, even if you're fishing the hardest rock bottom in the Gulf of Mexico, there's a, a silt layer on top of it. There's sand. And when that lead is disturbed on that silt layer, it creates a puff of sand. And that puff of sand is all that's needed to scare that 9, 10, 11 pound mangrove snapper off your bait. Those big, uh, smart fish are big for a reason. They've been around the block once or twice, and if your lead sitting there bouncing up and down off the bottom, he's not gonna eat it. He's not even gonna get close to it. You're gonna get no shot at it. But if you're moving that rod tip with the boat, the last trip I was on, I was having fun with it. I was actually totally looking away like that, trying to hold bottom and still feel the bite. And it's a good practice. It's good to try. and. If you're able to hold bottom like that, you're not going to, especially if you're using that sensitive braid with that top shot, the sensitive rod, the light combination so you can feel everything. You're using all those tools and the double snell rig. I mean, I could feel a fin, pinfish fart in 200 foot of water with this thing because I'm holding that line consistently tight enough to feel that lead 
but not disturb that lead on the bottom. And it seems really simple, but I see it messed up a lot offshore. And all it takes is for a second, if I look away and grab my beer, or I look away and talk to my buddy, or pull out my phone for a picture of the sunset, you're done. Uh, it takes just a second for him to hit that thread fin and pull it off your hook. So you gotta stay vigilant that whole time. And it just takes a split second for that trophy fish to bite that uh, sardine or thread fin. And you gotta put the hammer down, you gotta be ready. So that's kind of the secret methods that I use to help make sure that you keep uh, uh, catching a lot of mangroves. Also, what I forgot to discuss, and this is a bad example because I was out uh, fishing 220 foot of water, so I was using 80 pound test, but uh, let me get a better example. Um, when fishing for those mangrove snapper, you want to make sure you pick the right hooks for the job too. Now, you want to use a hook that has a very thin diameter uh, wire. So the wire is what makes up the hook. If you're using one of those four times strong hooks that's super thick, think about when you go to the doctor and get a uh, shot. <laughs> that super thin baby hairline needle is what you want, right? That thing goes right into your skin easily, you don't even feel it. But if they're using that big old horse needle, they gotta push that sucker into your skin. It hurts and you feel it and it's hard for them to penetrate. Whereas if you're using thin wire hooks with a very small barb, it's very easy for that hook to slide right in that fish's mouth. It's easy for them to get hooked and it's very easy for you to hook them. But the thinner the barb, because a lot of guys I'll see out there, they'll be using these barbs on their hook that are like ridiculous. They're sticking straight out perpendicular away from the hook. And the barb is great because once you drive that into the fish's mouth, he's hooked. He's not getting off that hook because that barb is so damn big. But it's very hard to get it through his mouth. So thinner barbed hooks are great because it's easy to get that fish hooked, but you have to keep that pressure as you reel them up because if you slow down, it's even easier for him to spit your hook. So you have to find that happy place. For me, I really like owner hooks. Owner hooks for snapper fishing, in my opinion, there's nothing better. Owner hooks are definitely where it's at, in my opinion. But uh, Mustad makes some really good types. Uh, Gamagatsu is great. Bass Pro Shop is a lot of the hooks I use because they have them in bulk. Uh, but wherever you want to find your hooks, I prefer, <clears throat> I've always grown up using owner hooks. They work well. But you want to find that happy medium of, if you're using a light hook, it's very easy to snap that hook. If you're using a heavier hook, it's going to be harder to hook that fish, but you're not going to snap the hook, you know? Also, what I see people mess up sometimes is uh, the, the misunderstanding between rod ratings, real drag ratings, and your line rating. People ask me all the time, well, if I'm using 50 pound test, my rod's only weighted, rated for 20, aren't I gonna break my rod? If your reel only has 15 pounds of drag, that means your rod only has to be rated for 15 pounds. You could use a 100 pound test and you're not gonna break your rod because your reel doesn't hold enough drag. So you really wanna pay attention to what your reel is weighted, rated for drag-wise. And if your reel's rated for 35, 40 pounds of drag, you wanna make sure you have it on a rod that's rated for 35, 40 pounds. And then your rub, excuse me, your line can be rated for anything because you're not gonna break it because that drag's gonna give. A lot of people use a mismatched tackle and that leads to less effective sensitivity. You want to use something that's really matched well, really balanced well, so you're able to have that sensitivity. And a lot of you guys are taller. I know I'm taller. And what I like doing is picking out rods that have longer butts. And the reason for that is I have this reel further from my body. Look how far I can fish it. I'm a, I'm a tall guy and that reel is far away from my body. I'm still comfortably fishing it. And I've got a nice long foregrip, so when I start catching a lot of fish and my hands get all slimy, I have a lot of different places to put my uh, hand on that foregrip. So I really like finding a rod with a nice, long, comfortable butt, so that way my reel is not right up on top of me. Like most rods off the shelf, this is how they would be with a guy my size. So if you're a taller, bigger guy, definitely find a rod with a bigger butt. Everybody likes a bigger butt. Okay.
<laughs> you I had the two uh, hooks on there. Uh, is that for, for really going deep, or is that is, do it for 20 or 30 or 50? Or? When I was a kid growing up on the party boats, I did 39 hour trips when I was six, seven, eight years old, nine years old. And when I was a kid, how they did the double hooks was, is they uh, used mustad long shanks and they opened the eye of the first hook and put the second hook mm -hmm. through it and then mm -hmm. closed the eye. That was the old school way of doing things. And that they used that for snapper fishing mainly. Now, nowadays in the late nineties, the double snell became popular. And since it's became widely adopted and we started using a lot, I pretty much use it for almost all my dead bait fishing. If I'm using dead bait, I'll stick to that double snell rig. Uh, and unless it's certain situations, like I'm fishing for hogfish and I want a really natural presentation, or I'm uh, knocker rigging and the bite's slow, or I'm <laughs> knocker rigging for tuna, then I'd use single hook. But generally, nine out of 10 times, if I'm dead bait fishing, whether it's for red grouper, mangrove snapper, gag grouper, sharks, it's double snell rigging. And the reason for that is, again, more hooks in the bait, higher hookup ratio. So the double hook rig I use almost all the time when I'm offshore and near shore fishing, even in 20, 30 foot of water. Uh, so I really like it. With grouper fishing, what I like doing, like red grouper fishing, Granted, the red grouper fishing hasn't been that great right now, but 2004 to 2015, when red grouper fishing was off the charts and you could drift through hard rock bottom areas and catch a uh, limit of them, I would uh, use a seven op hook on the bottom and then like a five or four or five op hook above it. And I'd space them out a little bit more and use a squid strip. And that was my dead bait for red grouper because I had that big hook in the middle of the squid strip and then on the top of the squid strip I had a real small hook. So that way if that porgy or gray snapper or uh, vermilion came up and bit it, I had a chance to catch him. But then I had the big hook there for the grouper too. So you can even get fancy with it and use different uh, sized hooks for your bait. Uh, and it works really, really well. So to answer your question, it's purely almost all dead bait fishing. I have a double hook rig. Live bait fishing, almost never use a double hook rig. Because for live bait fishing, I want a natural presentation. That's why I'm using, that's why I went through the drama of catching that live bait and buying that live bait or bringing that live bait. I want that natural presentation. Yeah. So a single hook is pretty much mandatory. But when I'm snapper fishing, big, big mangroves like a small live bait. So a lot of times I'll put a, a live bait on that double hook rig when I'm mangrove fishing because I'm too lazy to switch out rods or tie a new leader just because I want to use a different type of bait. And you just put it on that bottom, very last hook, and it works well. <coughs> Any other questions? You mentioned something about uh, the top shot. Mm -hmm. How long of a top shot leader would Good you question. So, uh, I prefer using monofilament for fishing. You'll notice my two bigger reels here are stacked with monofilament. No braid in those things. Well, there's, there's a little bit of braid backing, but <laughs> no braid anywhere near the top of the spool. And the reason for that is I prefer using monofilament when I'm fishing for big grouper, amberjack, uh, red snapper. If they're going to come up and hit that bait and run, you don't need sensitive line. They're going to do it for you. They're going to set the hook themselves. They're going to run circle hooks, monofilament. That's what I prefer. Now, for a fish like a mangrove snapper who's going to come up there, peck at my bait, I have to set the hook. I have to be active and vigilant. That's where I like using the braided line. That's where that sensitivity becomes super paramount. That's when I'll use the braided line, and that's when I'll use that top shot. Now, the, the length of the top shot, again, the reason behind it is you're using it as a shock absorber. It's the shocks on your truck. So you wanna have some nice shocks so you don't tear that hole. So you minimum typically about 20 feet of oh. top shot. But, um, and that's based on the depth too. I mean, if I'm fishing 10 feet of water, I'm only gonna have maybe three feet of top shot, you know? Uh, whereas it generally, as a rule of thumb, minimum about 20 to 30 feet from 50 foot of water out to 400 foot of water. But that top shot will lengthen based on my fishing environment. 
if I'm on a red snapper trip on a party boat and it's sold out because everybody only goes fishing when red snappers open <laughs> and that boat's sold out, then I'm going to use a longer top shot because what also top shot does is it makes your line act like everybody else's who fish mono and it prevents you getting tangled with your neighbor. And if you do get tangled, you're able to untangle it instead of just cutting that braid. Because if you have a short top shot and you get tangled with your buddy, it's generally gonna be braid that's tangled. What happens? You cut that braid, now you have to not only tie a new leader, you have to new, tie a new top shot and you just lost a ton of fishing time. So I lengthen my top shot when I'm fishing in a situation where I think a tangle may or may not occur. And generally increase that two to three times. So. If I'm fishing a real busy party boat trip, I might go 50, 60, 70 foot of top shot based on the depth of water, you know? So general rule on a busy party boat trip, about two thirds of your line in the water should be monofilament. Generally, when you're on your own private boat or your buddy's boat, maybe one third of your line in the water should be uh, monofilament. Gives you a good rule to start with. But and I notice you don't use circle hooks. I use circle hooks when I'm fishing the rule is, when you're offshore fishing for bottom reef species with natural bait, you must use an inline, non-stainless circle hook. That's the law. So when you come out in our boats and you rent a rod and reel from us, we're going to give you an inline, non-stainless circle hook. Me personally, with my personal tackle and my personal rods, I use a uh, V-hooker. I'll show you real quick. I use one of these de-hookers here and uh, a little bit of experience and I can unhook that fish no matter what size, what, what kind or type or size or where he's hooked type of hook. So for me personally, on my personal tackle, I personally prefer circle hooks when I'm fishing for fish that come up and eat that bait. So red snapper, amberjack, grouper, circle hooks are the way to go. But for fish that come up and peck at that bait, I'm personally, on my personal tackle, personally prefer to use uh, J-hooks. That way I can set that hook. And that's just the way I was raised, it's the way I've always fished, and that's why. Uh, but circle hooks work well, and a lot of people do use circle hooks with success. And like I said, we have to provide those, because that's a law. So we don't have J-hooks on our boat, we only have circle hooks. So if you come out fishing with us, that's what we're gonna give you. But if you use the right tools for the job, it doesn't matter what type of hook you're using. Let me show you here real quick. Has anybody seen one of these guys before? Yeah. Anybody not seen one of these before? Nobody? Everybody's seen one? Yeah. All right, so I won't show you the demonstration. But essentially, all you have to do is get the hook, hit the trigger, the fish falls to the floor. So it makes your life super, super easy, and it really doesn't matter where that fish is hooked. The idea behind the circle hook law was to preserve uh, our fishery by preventing dead discards. And in my opinion, it's kind of BS because I fish with circle hooks and I fish with J hooks and I fish a lot. And I've seen fish with circle hooks hooked in the throat, hooked in the top of the face, the bottom of the face, all over. And I've seen with J hooks, fish hooked in the corner of the mouth, top of the mouth, all over. The, the, the idea behind it is with the circle hook, predominantly that fish is hooked in the corner of the mouth and it's easier to unhook that fish with less harm to the fish. To me, personally, if you aren't feeling that bite and you're staying active on that rod and you're holding that bottom naturally, when you feel that bite, you set that hook real quick, that fish doesn't have a chance to swallow that bait. So most of the time he's hooked right in the chick, uh, right in the mouth and you're using that de-hooker tool, he's only out of the water for three or four seconds, he's gonna go back to the bottom no matter what. So again, me personally, I like using J-hooks for fish that nibble, but that's me. Uh, but you have to make sure that you have that de-hooking tool and that you're releasing those fish quickly, efficiently. You have to vent your fish. Everybody knows what venting is, right? All right, cool. Just wanna make sure we cover that because Super important that you have a venting tool on the boat or a descending device. Everybody know what a descending device is? Uh, those of you who don't know what a descending device is, is it idiot proofs uh, and makes your life a whole lot, hell of a lot easier when uh, releasing uh, barotrauma fit, bar 
fish that have experienced barotrauma. So what dentine does is it releases the excess gases, but dentine requires you to puncture that fish and puncture him properly and not puncture him too deep or puncture the wrong thing. A lot of people, when they get a venting tool in their hands, they just start stabbing the fish. And stab them anywhere and everywhere, and that doesn't work. Because a lot of times they'll have that uh, swim bladder or belly protruding their stomach, and if you puncture that, you're gonna kill the fish. Yeah. You might as well just throw the fish back without venting them. And a lot of people vent improperly, and that's the problem. They made that rule about circle hooks the same time they made the rule about ma making it mandatory you had to have a venting tool. And they made those laws together and they actually repealed the law about venting because they found it actually killed more fish because people were venting improperly. So it's more important to know how to vent properly right up underneath that <clears throat> dorsal fin. And I always hold my venting tool with my thumb and forefinger to make sure I'm not penetrating too deeply because you don't want to poke any other organs. Just enough to get under the skin to release that gas and he's gone. A descending device is a tool or device that attaches to that fish and it allows you to send them back down the bottom without penetrating it. So the most popular one is a sequelizer. It's a little tool, you set the depth on it, you clamp it to the fish's jaw just like a boca grip would. You hold that fish up by that boca grip style clamp system, drop them over the side of the boat with a weight and it drops to bottom. Once it gets at the depth you set it for, it releases the clamp and that fish swims away. So it's a really, really healthy, fish safe way to release those fish with barotrauma without puncturing them. So descending device is a new gold standard at the council and they're really moving towards really advocating that and pushing that. CCA, ASA, Golf Council, everybody wants everybody offshore to be using descending devices. And that's great. They work well, but in certain instances, like on a party boat where we're catching a really high rate of fish and there's a bunch of people on the boat, a descending device is unrealistic. Because if, how many of you guys have been on one of those 39 hour trips? Oh, you guys, come on. All right, so, uh, so on one of those trips and we're catching a ton of fish and fish are all over the deck, it would be physically impossible for us to keep up with that rate of catching. And we would kill more fish because they'd be laying on deck waiting to be descended for 20 minutes. Whereas we can run down the deck and vent 10 of them and release them in 30 seconds. So descending is great in small platforms with a limited number of anglers in certain situations. But when you get high catch rates and the fish are just coming over the side of the boat, descending devices don't work. That's why I personally prefer venting. And that's why we really emphasize venting on our party boats. But descending devices is that other tool that's out there. And if you don't know what it is, I'd highly recommend checking into it and using it on your own personal boats if you're out there fishing deeper. Because how many times have you vented a fish, even vented him properly and tossed him back and he still floats away? You seen it? I've seen it. It's, it happens 10% of the time. So descending devices, that doesn't happen because that fish gets down to the bottom no matter what if you're using the heavy enough weight. So descending device does really, really help with that release mortality. But in my opinion, venting properly is gonna help just as good 90, 92% of the time. <laughs> All right, uh, what was your question? Oh, on your uh, mango rod. Mm -hmm. What is your ideal size hook for mang mangroves? Depends on the depth, uh, shallow water, about four to five off, up to about maybe 90, 100 foot of water, past about 100, 120 foot of water, about uh, six off would probably be my go-to, five or six off. So it kind of depends on your depth. It's kind of a gradient. And it, it de depends on your size of mangrove snapper. If I'm going after a really big yeah. eight, nine, 10 pound mangrove, I'm gonna use a six off hook. And out there in that deeper water where those fish live, there's a chance that I might also hook a grouper and using a four or five out hook, I'm not gonna have a chance to hook that grouper. I want a bigger hook out there because there's bigger fish to catch. Okay. So. How about um, inshore mangoes, like inside of the skyway? Oh, uh, probably like a two out or three out hook. Yeah, you wanna use a smaller hook because they have a smaller mouth. Uh, but you also don't wanna use too small of a hook because you're gonna miss that quick biting fish. So I probably wouldn't use anything less than about two out, but 
two to three would probably be my go-to based on the size bait you're using. All right. If you're going after a big one, I would use a bigger hook. But live shrimp around the Skyway, I'd probably use about a two-hot hook. And double snelling works great even with live shrimp. You can put two live shrimps on those hooks, both tail hooked, and it's like a buffet. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a lot of practice that. Thank you for teaching me. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> You're offshore and you pull up to a spot. Yep. What do you drop down first? Live bait? Good question. You want to Good pin, question. Sardines, live sardines. In my opinion, dead bait. Uh, on my charters, uh, when I'm fishing with buddies, I like dropping all dead bait to start. And then after everybody hits yeah. bottom, if, if no one gets hit right away, drop down a live bait. A lot of times that first bait that's a little different gets nailed. And also uh, offshore, some most of the time, when you get to a spot, especially a good spot, there's a couple really aggressive fish that are ready to hit quickly. And those fish are gonna bite just about anything, whether it's live bait, dead bait, or jigs. Uh, now, if five of us drop down dead, dead bait and one drops down a live bait, he's gonna get hit by that big aggressive fish because it's a little bit different, you know? So. If you're not fishing with friends and you want to catch the biggest fish, <laughs> drop a little something different. A lot of times for me, it's a jig. I'll drop down a vertical jig really quickly because I know that jig's going to get to bottom before anybody else. Because that jig's just let. There's nothing dragging that jig like a, a live bait would drag your hook. So I'll cast out a jig and that lets me cover a lot of area around the spot real quick. And it also is something very unique, different from everything else on the bottom. And a lot of times it gives you that that big aggressive fish a chance to hit your bait first but dead bait is always what i would in a perfect world everybody drops dead bait and the reason behind it is that big aggressive fish only has one option it's dead bait he's going to hit somebody's line and also it gets the smell going in the water it gets that spot woke up and then after a couple minutes of dead bait fishing then you can switch baits and people can start using live bait or jigs or whatever and then the spots woke up those fish know something's going on they start feeding you know because essentially, especially with mangrove snapper, on a party boat, everybody's, what, what's the best fish, spot to fish? What's the best spot to fish? The best spot to fish on any boat is next to an experienced angler. Because you can get those fish fired up. I notice it all the time. I'll fish on the bow, I'll fish on the side, I don't care where I fish. But once you hook one of those mangrove snapper, cast out in that same spot, get down to that same spot, you're going to hook another one. And you'll hook three and then four and then five and then all of a sudden every time you hit bottom you're getting bites whereas the guy next to the rail 10 spots down is like what the fuck is this guy doing you know and he gets upset about it and it's purely just you're getting that feeding frenzy going under your feet on the bottom because you're catching those fish you're not missing those fish and you get that feeding frenzy going by using that dead bait and catching those fish and then the other snapper come over to see what's going on and you get that frenzy going and the way you do that is with that dead bait and when you catch a snapper especially out in deep water the barachama occurs so they're regurgitating everything because their stomachs getting poked out of their mouth so on the way to the surface that everything they've sweet. been eating is spitting up so now you're creating an even bigger chum slick and that's why when you've been fishing a spot for 20 30 40 minutes 50 minutes a shark will pop up or a tuna or a kingfish or a wahoo or a mahi because you're creating that natural chum slick with that dead bait. If everybody's using jigs, it takes a whole heck of a lot longer. So my always go-to is dead bait to answer your question. Any other questions? Can you put the, uh, the double um, hook down right here so I can get a picture yeah. of it? Well, the, uh, oh, we'll see how. Uh, yeah, I will, but uh, what's cool, uh, what I think is cool, about our website, hubbardsmarina.com. Uh, I spend a lot of time and energy making, uh, adding stuff to it, and adding videos and information to it. And uh, uh, it's even if you have your own boat or you fish on another charter boat, you're never gonna fish with me. Our website is still a good tool for you because when you go to our website and click fishing trips, under the fishing trips tab, there is a fishing tips and tricks page. And on that fishing tips and tricks page, there's a lot of information about braided line, conventional versus spinning reels, how weather affects fishing, how to tie a double snell rig, how to brine your bait, how to cut a sardine plug, how to rig a double snell rig. A lot of these helpful tips and tricks videos that you might find helpful, like how to tie them. And then also, besides that, we have a weather links page. So if you have your own boat, 
again, you're never gonna fish with us, but you wanna look for some good marine weather forecasts, I've essentially compiled everything that I use and everything that I like a lot right in one place for you. And then also we have all our seminars, like our Bass Pro Shop seminars, and all our live fishing conversation Q&A shows that we do every Sunday night, we post there too. So there's a ton of helpful information there waiting for you. But I'll still set it down for you. So good, I already hooked the chair. <laughs> Bring it in. <laughs> I don't know how to tie that from your video. I never yeah. could have imagined how simple it really is. Yeah, it's pretty pretty easy. It's pretty quick, too. Yeah. Um, also, a great resource, if you're not familiar with it, it this guy is in the back, but uh, Salt Strong. Uh, I work with them pretty closely, uh, especially inshore fishermen. Uh, it's even more powerful because Salt Strong is basically an online community. Uh, it's like Facebook or uh Instagram, but instead of being so negative, it's very, very <laughs> crazy positive. And like on Facebook, they blur out backgrounds and stuff like that with Salt Strong. They'll post a photo of the redfish that he caught. They'll tell you what time of day, what the water clarity was, what color lure they were using, what the tide was doing. And a lot of times they'll drop a pin on where they caught it. And then they'll tell you how to dissect the spot yourself. It's crazy what they do in the community. And uh, if you go to saltstrong.com forward slash Hubbard, that's my personal page. There's some free videos there and there's some of the courses. Like uh, I have a grouper course on there, an American Red Snapper course, a mangrove snapper course, and they're at a super discounted rate if you go through my link. Again, saltstrong.com forward slash Hubbard. And that course is literally me on the boat with a rod in my hand showing you how to do this stuff. And if you have your own boat, it even has stuff like how to rape how to read your bottom finder, how to anchor on a spot, how to prep for a trip. A lot of really, really cool information that you just can't cover in a classroom setting like this. So that's a great resource as well. And I don't know if you, if you I see know that ours, covering. I don't know how many, what are we up to, about 70 now, John? A ton. Uh, it's take, gotta be 60 there, to 70. There's a guy that calls Anderson. Mm -hmm. Anderson calls him Tarkin John. Mm -hmm. It's because he always talks about Tarkin. When he called it, I'm on hold. And he called in one Saturday and he said, I'm here to give the South Sur Anglers credit. He said, my brother and I wanted to go for Kingfish or King Mackerel. And so they went to where Dave Dennison had been out and done a, a, a seminar for us. Mm -hmm. Watched it two or three times each. They got the right bait. They got to the right spot near where he said to go. And they found the hard bottom, blah, blah, blah. Threw a line in the water, caught a 38 pound kingfish first line in the water second when they caught one it's 42 and they just sit there and went what are we supposed to do now they've never had any kind of luck anything <laughs> like that he says i really got to thank the south sir anglers and i just hung up and sent anderson a text tell tarpon john thanks for the south sir anglers report i got nothing better than that this week and that is and you do a lot of that you do way more than that and it's the great part of it is you still have to do your homework mm -hmm but it cuts the learning curve so much. Yep. When you got all the, when you got everything ready, yep. they got, they knew what to have ready mm -hmm. and they just hit the spot, right time, right place, the whole nine yards, bang, bang, bang. And they're yep. like, you know, like I say, what are we supposed to do now? We've never had this kind of luck. Do we drink beer? Do we leave? Do we go get it clean and cook it? What are we supposed to do now? And that's, it doesn't get any better than that. No. So. Beer for sure. Well, yeah. that's true. Yes. <laughs> It is, it is really cool. Uh, a lot of these seminars and a lot of the information that's online just ready and waiting for you guys to go out there and consume it. And uh, a lot of people argue that's part of what's the problem with our fishery nowadays is it's so easy to go out there on YouTube and uh, on Facebook and find information like that and get your hands on all the tools to do it. All you need to do is go out there and do it. And then you have things like the Lawrence machines up there and the Simrad machines up there. And you can, you have the side scan. So if you get within 90 feet of your fishing spot, you can see the freaking rock over in the corner of the store. I mean, it's pretty, they make it pretty idiot proof offshore nowadays with all. And then the new trolling motors that you hit a button and it holds your boat. I mean, yeah. what in the world? Yeah. Those fish don't stand a chance, and uh, they definitely make it a lot easier in that manner. Uh, and there's a lot of technology out there. Every day something else is coming out uh, to make it even easier offshore. So 
Offshore fishing, uh, it was an art form, and nowadays it's still an art form, but it's a whole heck of a lot. It's like middle school art now. <laughs> AI art. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Any other questions? I think I'm running out of time here, huh, Steve? Have you ever caught two fish on the two years? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it happens a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even, if, especially when the mangroves get fired up, like I was saying before, when you catch one, all of a sudden you catch two, and then you get that insta bite going, and a lot of times you'll catch two at a time. Well, not a lot of times, but some of the time. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Because then you don't know what you got. Yeah. It's, it's just like, yeah. Know, they're pulling against each other, too, with everything else you got. It's, These are right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say it, Jim. No, no. <laughs> you mean the, the teaser rig? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's an infamous day. The somewhere I think it was better when <coughs> had a show on. Yeah. It's about August. You know when the bait gets like this. You see, guys, this is what you do. You have one in the tail, one in the nose, and now you've taken an inch and a half, and you've made it about two and a half inches. So it's all with <laughs> on the bait, and it's dancing it because they're fighting each other. Yeah. Yeah, those shrimp are small about this time. Of two year. weeks after I saw that, Jim and I were fishing down off of Anna Maria. Jim, we're going to do the teaser thing. No, we don't have to do that. Yeah, we're going to cook one head, one of those. Try it, Jim. No, I'm not going to do that. Well, I tell you what, if it doesn't work, I'll call everybody and tell. I'll call into Anderson, and tell him how how stupid I am. If it does, all you have to do is say, a well-respected South Shore angler gave me this tip. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, fishing with a bobber. Go ahead, Jim. Threw it out. And I'm going, God knows, please. I gotta fish with him all day long. <laughs> Threw it out. The barber was coming down, hit the water, and kept going.